Hey there, Miss Cindy from the Alexandria Museum of Art, and welcome to another week of our Charlotte's Web Book Club. Um, we are in, I think, week seven of the book club. We are on chapter 13, um, and I am going to read chapters 13 and 14 today. Now remember, if you're just tuning into our Charlotte's Web Book Club, you can always find the other videos on our YouTube channel. Um, it's Alexandria Museum of Art YouTube channel. So go check out the previous episodes there. Chapter 13, Good Progress. Far into the night, while the other creatures slept, Charlotte worked on her web. First, she ripped out a few of the orb lines near the center. She left the radial lines alone, as they were needed for support. As she worked, her eight legs were a great help to her. So were her teeth. She loved to weave, and she was an expert at it. When she was finished ripping things out, her web looked like her webs looked something like this. A spider can produce several kinds of thread. She uses a dry, tough thread for foundation lines, and she uses a sticky thread for snare lines, the ones that catch and hold insects. Charlotte decided to use her dry thread for writing the new message. If I write the word terrific with sticky thread, she thought, every bug that comes along will get stuck in it and spoil the effect. It's pretty smart. Now, let's see. The first letter is T. Charlotte climbed to a point at the top of the left-hand side of the web, swinging her spinnerets into position. She attached her thread and then dropped down. As she dropped, her spinning tubes went into action and she let out thread. At the bottom, she attached the thread. This formed an upright part of the letter T. Charlotte was not satisfied, however. She climbed up and made her another attachment right next to the first. Then she carried the line down so that she had a double line instead of a single line. It will show up better if I make the whole thing with double lines. She climbed back up, moved over about an inch to the left, touched her spinnerets to the web, and then carried a line across the, to the right, forming the top of the T. She repeated this, making it double. Her eight legs were very busy helping. Now for the E. Charlotte got so interested in her work, she began to talk to herself, as though to cheer herself on. If you had been sitting quietly in the barn cellar that evening, you would have heard something like this. Now for the R. Up we go, attach, descend, pay out line, Whoa, attach, good. Up you go, repeat, attach, descend, pay out line. Whoa, girl, steady now. Attach, climb, attach. Over to the right, pay out line, attach. Now right and down and swing that loop around and around. Now to the left, attach, climb, repeat, okay. Easy, keep those lines together. Now. Then and out, down for the leg of the R. Pay out line, whoa, attach, ascend, repeat, good girl. And so talking to herself, the spider worked at her difficult task. When it was completed, she felt hungry. She had a small bug that had been, she had been saving. Then she slept. Next morning, Wilbur arose and stood beneath the web. He breathed the morning air into his lungs. Drops of dew catching the sun made the web stand out clearly. When Larvae arrived with breakfast, there was the handsome pig. And over him, woven neatly in block letters, was the word terrific. Another miracle. Larvae rushed and called Mr. Zuckerman. Mr. Zuckerman rushed and called Mrs. Zuckerman. Mrs. Zuckerman ran to the phone and called the Arables. The arables climbed into their truck and hurried over. Everybody stood at the pig pen and stared at the web and read the word over and over. While Wilbur, who really felt terrific, stood quietly, swelling out his chest and swinging his snout from side to side. Terrific, breathed Zuckerman in joyful admiration. Edith, you better phone the reporter on the Weekly Chronicle and tell him what has happened. He will want to know about this pig. He may want to bring a photographer. There isn't a pig in the whole state that is terrific as our pig. The news spread. 
people who had journeyed to see Wilbur when he was some pig came back again to see him now that he was terrific. That afternoon, when Mr. Zuckerman went to milk the cows and clean out the tie-ups, he was still thinking about what a wondrous pig he owned. Lurvy, he called. There is to be no more cow manure thrown into that pig pen. I have a terrific pig. I want that pig to have a clean, bright straw every day for his bedding. Understand? Yes, sir, said Lurvy. Furthermore, said Mr. Zuckerman, I want you to start building a crate for Wilbur. I have decided to take the pig to the county fair on September 6th. Make the crate large and paint it green with gold letters. What will the letters say? asked Lurvy. They should say, Zuckerman's famous pig. Lurvy picked up a pitchfork and walked away to get some clean straw. Having such an important pig was going to mean plenty of extra work. He could see that. Below the apple orchard, at the end of the path, was the dump where Mr. Zuckerman threw all sorts of trash and stuff that nobody wanted anymore. Here in a small clearing, hidden by young alders and wild raspberry bushes, was an astonishing pile of old bottles and empty tin cans and dirt rags and bits of metal and broken bottles and broken hinges and broken springs and dead batteries and last month's magazine and old discarded dish mops and tattered overalls and rusty spikes and leaky pails and forgotten stoppers and useless junk of all kinds, including a wrong size crank for a broken ice cream freezer. Templeton knew the dump and liked it. There were good hiding places there, excellent cover for a rat. And there was usually a tin can with food still clinging to the inside. Templeton was down there now, rummaging around. When he returned to the barn, he carried in his mouth an advertisement he had torn from a scrumpled magazine. How's this, he asked, showing the ad to Charlotte. It says crunchy. Crunchy beat would be a good word to write in her web. Just the wrong idea, replied Charlotte. Couldn't be worse. We don't want Zuckerman to think Wilbur is crunchy. He might start thinking about crisp, crunchy bacon and tasty ham. That would put ideas into his head. We must advertise Wilbur's noble qualities, not his tastiness. Get another word, please, Templeton. The rat looked disgusted, but he sneaked away to the dump and was back in a while with a strip of cotton cloth. How's this? It's a label off an old shirt. Charlotte examined the label. It said pre-shrunk. I'm sorry, Templeton, but pre-shrunk is out of the question. We want Zuckerman to think Wilbur is nicely filled out, not all shrunk up. I'll have to ask you to try again. What do you think I am, a messenger boy? Grumbled the rat. I'm not going to spend all my time chasing to, down to the dump after advertising material. Just once more, please, said Charlotte. I'll tell you what I'll do, said Templeton. I know where there's a package of soap flakes in the woodshed. It has writing all over it. I'll bring you a piece of the package. He climbed the rope that hung on the wall and disappeared through a hole in the ceiling. When he came back, he had a strip of blue and white cardboard in his teeth. There, he said triumphantly, how's that? Charlotte read the words, with new radiant action. What does it mean, asked Charlotte, who had never used soap flakes in her life. How should I know, said Templeton. You asked for words and I brought them. I suppose the next thing you'll want me to fetch is a dictionary. Together they studied the soap ad. With new radiant action, repeated Charlotte slowly. Wilbur, she called. Wilbur, who was asleep in the straw, jumped up. Run around, commanded Charlotte. I want to see you in action to see if you are radiant. Wilbur raced to the end of his yard. Now back again faster, said Charlotte. Wilbur galloped back. His skin shone. His tail was a fine, tight curl in it. Jump into the air, cried Charlotte. Wilbur jumped as high as he could. Keep your knees straight and touch the ground with your ears, called Charlotte. Wilbur obeyed. Do a backflip with a half twist in it, cried Charlotte. 
Wilbur went over backwards, writhing and twisting as he went. Okay, Wilbur, said Charlotte. You can go back to sleep. Okay, Templeton, the so bad will do, I guess. I'm not sure Wilbur's action is exactly radiant, but it's interesting. Actually, said Wilbur, I feel radiant. Do you? said Charlotte, looking at him with affection. Well, you're a good little pig, and radiant you shall be. I'm in this pretty deep now. I might as well go the limit. Tired from his romp, Wilbur lay down in the clean straw. He closed his eyes. The straw seemed scratchy, not as comfortable as the cow manure, which was always delightfully soft to lie in. So he pushed the straw to one side and stretched out in the manure. Wilbur sighed. It had been a busy day, his first day of being terrific. Dozens of people had visited his yard during the afternoon, and he had to stand and pose, looking as terrific as he could. Now he was tired. Fern had arrived and seated herself quietly on her stool in the corner. Tell me a story, Charlotte, said Wilbur, as he lay waiting for sleep to come. Tell me a story. So Charlotte, although she too was tired, did what Wilbur wanted. Once upon a time, she began, I had a beautiful cousin who managed to build her web across a small stream. One day, a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. My cousin was very much surprised, of course. The fish was thrashing wildly. My cousin hardly dared tackle it, but she did. She swooped down and threw great masses of wrapping material around the fish and fought bravely to capture it. Did she succeed? asked Wilbur. It was a never to be forgotten battle, said Charlotte. There was the fish caught only by one fin and its tail wildly, wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. There was the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish. How much did the fish weigh? asked Wilbur eagerly. Oh, I don't know, said Charlotte. There was my cousin, slipping in, dodging out, beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing her threads and fighting hard. First, she threw a left around the tail. The fish lashed back. Then a left to the tail and a right to the midsection. The fish lashed back. Then she dodged to one side and threw a right and another right to the fin. Then a hard left to the head and while the fish swayed and stretched. Then what happened, asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. The fish lost the fight. My cousin wrapped it up so tight it couldn't budge. Then what happened, asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. My cousin kept the fish for a while and then, when she got good and ready, she ate it. Tell me another story, begged Wilbur. So Charlotte told him about another cousin of hers who was an aeronaut. A balloonist, said Charlotte. My cousin used to stand on her head and let out enough thread to form a balloon. Then she'd go and be lifted into the air and carry upward on the warm wind. Is that true, asked Wilbur, or are you just making it up? It's true, replied Charlotte. I have some very remar remarkable cousins. And now, Wilbur, it's time you went to sleep. Sing something, begged Wilbur, closing his eyes. So Charlotte sang a lullaby while crickets chirped in the grass and the barn grew dark. This was the song she sang. Sleep. Sleep, my love, my only, deep, deep in the dung in the dark. Be not afraid and be not lonely. This is the hour when frogs and thrushes praise the world from the woods and the rushes. Rest from the care, my, own, my one and only, deep in the dung in the dark. But Wilbur was already asleep. When the song ended, Fern got up and went home. Dr. Dorian the next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink, drying the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arable worked silently. She hoped Fern would go out and play with the other children, 
instead of heading to the Zuckerman's barn to sit and watch animals. Charlotte is the best storyteller I ever heard, said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can, replied Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell, asked Mrs. Arable. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who caught a fish in a web. Don't you think that's fascinating? Fern, dear, how would a fish get in a spider's web? Said Mrs. Arable, you know it couldn't happen. You're making it up. Oh, it happens all right, replied Fern. Charlotte never fibs. This cousin of hers built a web across a stream. One day she was hanging around on the web and a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. The fish caught by one fin, mother, its tail wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. Can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out, and she was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing firm snapped her mother. Stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said Fern. I'm just telling you the facts. What finally happened? Asked her mother, whose curiosity began to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped up the fish and then she ate him when she got good and ready. Spiders have to eat, same as the rest of us. Charlotte has another cousin who's a balloonist. She stands on her head and lets out a lot of line and is carried aloft by the winds. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling, I wish you would play outside today instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Fern disappeared after a while walking down the road towards the Zuckermans. Her mother dusted the sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a little girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mrs. Arable made up her mind. She would pay a call on to old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arable and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of the barn near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. How enchanting. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, said Mrs. Arable, but it all started with that pig we let Fern raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig and ever since it left our place, Fern has been going down to our uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about that pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he's quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? Asked Mrs. Arable nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, well do you understand it? asked Miss Arable. Understand what? Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh no, said Dr. Dorian, I don't understand it. But for the, that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle. But nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web, said Mrs. Arable. I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one? Asked Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arable shifted uneasily in her chair. No, but I can crochet a doily and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but somebody taught you, didn't they? My mother taught me. Well, who taught the spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got in the web. I don't understand it 
and I don't like what I don't understand. None of us do, said Dr. Dorian, sighing. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything, but I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arable fidgeted. Fern says the animals like to talk to each other, Dr. Dorian. Do you believe that animals talk? I never heard one say anything, he replied, but that proves nothing. It is quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me and that I just didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says that the animals in Zuckerman's barn talk, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. I give you my word on that. Well, I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arable. You don't think I need to worry about her. Does she look well, said the doctor. Oh, yes. Appetite good? Oh, yes, she's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh, yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she will always love animals, but I doubt that she spends her entire life in Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arable brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes again and went into deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm, remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say offhand that spiders and pigs were fully as interesting as Henry Fussy. Yet, I predict that the day will come when even Henry will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How's Avery, he asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery is always fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything that he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. Mrs. Arable said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. All right. Well, so that's where we leave it this week. So I just want to remind you that if there were any words in today's reading that you didn't quite understand or you might not know the meaning, might be a really good idea to jot those words down and go look them up online. Or if you have a dictionary at home, go look it up on the diction in the dictionary. Now, but it might be even more fun to try to guess what the word might mean um, using some context clues around the word, like in the paragraph, and think about what it might mean and then go see how close you got when you look it up, okay? All right, well, that was really fun. I can't wait to see what happens next. It looks like people are really noticing Charlotte's words that she's putting in the web for Wilbur, so I really, really hope that that's gonna save Wilbur. I mean, I think it might, you know? Um, Mr. Zuckerman did insist on him having better bedding and that kind of thing. So hopefully that means that he's in the clear, but we'll see what happens, okay? You guys have right. a great week, and I'll see you next Friday when we will look at the next two chapters of Charlotte's Web.